Welcome to Team Talk from Team Kinetic, the podcast that takes a deeper dive into volunteer management with me, Chris Martin. Welcome to Team Talk from Team Kinetic with me, Chris Martin. And from this week, we'll be extending your podcast hosting team to welcome Imo Greatbatch. Imo is kindly volunteering her time as a co-host with me, as well as working behind the scenes with this series. And anybody who knows Imo knows she loves creating a great conversation and raising the awareness around volunteering. Imo comes with loads of knowledge and experience. He's currently the head of volunteering with England Netball. Welcome to the team, Imo. Thanks, Chris. I'm really excited to be here, especially with today's guests. Really big passion of mine is volunteering, so I can't wait to get into some of the stuff we're going to talk to our guests today. Okay, so Team Talk is the podcast that dives deeper into the world of volunteer management, and we'd like to get to know the people who make volunteering happen, why they do it, how they got there in the first place, and what they want to see change. And if you're new to listening to the podcast, welcome. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Fab. Thanks, Chris. So today's podcast is really going to dive into the fact that in addition to Volunteers Week taking place in June, the vision for volunteering for the next 10 years was launched too. And we're delighted to welcome Gethin, Jenny and James, who were part of the project to this episode. Gethin Williams is a volunteering strategist and non-profit specialist with 20 years experience across the UK charity sector and central government. He's worked extensively in volunteering, youth, sport, disability and environment sectors and held senior strategic and operational roles in policy and comms, business and workforce development, infrastructure and membership services, community development and charity governance. Outside of work, he's also a volunteer on a board of trustees and is involved in delivering an annual music festival, as well as being part of the team who wrote this vision for volunteering. Jenny Betteridge is the strategic lead for volunteering at Sport England, a national public funded organisation with a mission to enable everyone to benefit from sport and activity. Jenny has an extensive professional background in volunteer management and works on supporting investments into community volunteering and out of work. She's also a trustee on a registered charity, a mentor and active part of her local community as a volunteer who regularly blogs on key topics which you can read about on the Sport England website. And last but by no means least, we've got James Allen, who's the Director of Council working with various clients across sport and physical activity, private and voluntary sectors in a range of areas including public affairs, communications, research and governance. James has been working in and around sport for the last decade, prior to which he worked in government, politics, the charity sector and financial services. Outside of work, he's a trustee of Disability Sports Coach in London and the Bristol Sport Foundation and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. James worked as part of the wider team to develop the vision for volunteering and led the project around the specific elements for this um, for Sport England. So three fantastic guests that I can't wait to get into conversation with, Chris. Throwing it back to you. Thank you. So welcome, Jenny, Gethin and James. Great to have you on the hottest day of the year. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Likewise. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Absolutely. And James, I think on an, it feels like another podcast to find out more about the Royal Society of Arts. So it's, a, it's a string to your bow that I didn't know about. So uh, maybe that's one for a, for a different day, a different podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man of mystery, Chris, but very happy, <laughs> very happy to come back. Um, so here on Team Talk, we like to get to know our guests a little bit. Uh, and we thought we'd start with a little bit about you and your motivations and what attracted you to work within the voluntary sector. You know, was there a particular moment or person that inspired you? And if, if, if we can start with Jenny, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what, what brought you to this particular strange endeavour that is volunteer management. Thank you. I'm not sure it's necessarily a particular moment. I think it's probably more a, a mindset of values. I actually have a background in community and national politics. So I worked for the Labour Party for 13 years. And actually, um, when you kind of think about the two, you think kind of community politics and sports volunteering, perhaps you might not see the similarities. But for me, it's absolutely <laughs> about people in their communities wanting positive change for themselves, their families, their friends, their communities. And what does that look like? So for politics, that could be anything from, you know, sorting out fly tipping, uh, antisocial behaviour, campaigning to keep the library, invest in the NHS, whatever that positive change is for them and their community. And if you play that wider for sport and physical activity, it's exactly the same. 
it's about physical well-being it's about prevention of um kind of health it's about mental well-being it's about community connection it's about knowing each other getting to know your neighbors and building that strength from your community out so i'm i don't know whether i'm a sport agnostic or an atheist you know i don't have a particular one that's amazing all of them are amazing all of them have huge impact whether that's hula hooping or netball or rugby or any any of them it's it's a way to be active together with your community and volunteering is a really important part of that and 10 million people last year of all years gave up their time to help uh, their community be be active and that's a really powerful thing fantastic thanks jenny uh getting a little bit about your uh, your journey to uh, your journey through volunteer management should we say my journey through volunteer well yeah it's um it's weird how you get into things isn't it really i mean when i came out of school and university i didn't really know that working in the charity sector existed as a thing i think we're probably really bad at explaining that i fell into it kind of quite by accident you know like many people you just want to do something useful and then you kind of end up there and so i sort of wandered through the voluntary sector in all sorts of different areas like the littlest hobo or something that's kind of how i feel at times <laughs> moving on for listeners old enough to remember that reference one for the kids but volunteering has been um, a real feature of the last sort of 10 years or so of my work and I guess it's the backbone of so much voluntary activity and I just find it really fascinating area to work in you know when you take kind of money off the table to some degree and I'm not getting into a volunteering is not free conversation here there's plenty of time for that <laughs> but when you take money out of the motivations and uh, around volunteering you realize kind of how interesting it is and all of this all of this fascinating value that it generates on all these different levels for the people that you support for the volunteer themselves and wider society and in the last 10 years of working in the charity sector particularly financial climate's been so tough i think there's a there's an onus on charities to sort of do do everything they can with the assets that they have and i find volunteering really unique in that respect which is why i love working in it so much thank you cheers Gaffin. and james tell us a little bit about your journey yeah sure thanks chris I, I guess kind of similar to the other two um no particular sort of big moment where uh, i came into this space i think like a lot of people i slightly kind of got into it by accident and uh through a process of, of evolution over time so a, a bit like jenny a lot of my kind of volunteering and, and professional backgrounds uh, has been in, in and around labor politics and when i left university i also didn't really realize or think about the voluntary sector is something that that might be a source of employment i i wanted to work in in politics and the, the reason for doing that was that i was passionate about changing things and and making society a bit fairer and and more progressive and and over time i think just kind of honed that down and became a bit more specific about what that could look like and and and, and what that means in terms of of sport volunteering i've been engaged in sport in in different ways for for most of my life so as a very enthusiastic but but not at all talented participant in, in a few <laughs> different sports my children now are uh, whether they like it or not um into a variety of, of kind of sport and various uh, kind of physical activities uh i have volunteered in various roles as well but it's it's in the last kind of 10 years where the two things have have come together Interestingly, and I think something that, that came through the work we did with, with Vision, and I think we'll, we'll probably talk about today, is how the sector can get a bit better at articulating some of this. So the cause around sport, the social difference that it makes, which I do think other bits of the voluntary sector are probably a bit further ahead in. So perhaps something we could explore, but but a challenge that, that we've been really interested in and, and a part of the Vision exercise that we particularly enjoyed as well. Thank you. And I think even from that brief introduction, you already set the scene for some of the themes that we're going to sort of cover the, um, the the route into volunteering that people find and the different the different hats that people wear and the different ways in which you you find yourself wanting to give back and generate community. These are they're almost sort of fundamental human desires that we you know to be belong and be part of something and create a community that's you know whether it be it political or be it sport or be it, you know there's there's definitely some key themes that came through just in that sort of brief little introduction to you all that that hopefully i think we're going to revisit a little bit as we go through some of this stuff yeah definitely chris and i and i feel like um that was a perfect segue as if we if we knew we wanted it to lead us into the vision for volunteering <laughs> um and i think for those listening we need to navigate we, we feel like we've got a bit of a team talk party going on here with all five of us we feel like this is quite ambitious having five three guests and two co-hosts on a, on a podcast so 
in relation to that um, vision for volunteering, it, it kind of set out that big question of how does volunteering need to adapt by 20, sort of 32? And if I take us back to that day that we were in Birmingham NEC, where there's going to be an exciting sport event later this year, but for the Volunteer Expo, where it was really publicly launched, and I know um, we got to see each other there, we just sort of wanted to, to dive into that was the public promotion but there has been an iceberg of underwater activity in kind of getting it to that point. What, why is it important to have this kind of vision for volunteering and, and ask those big questions? And, and Gethin, can we start that with you? Great question. It's, it's important because there's a real moment here for volunteering. We have these fairly rarely. And I think when they come along, it's our duty to uh, mine them a little bit and see what we can get out of it. When you look into the vision, you'll see there's five themes there. The first one is awareness and appreciation. I think there was a strong feeling from everyone working behind the scenes on the vision, under the water in the iceberg, if you like. The moment that we've just been through in the pandemic and the role that volunteering played and the contribution that it made was, was so vital that it deserves to be kind of crystallized and, and understood a bit better really, um, and figure out what we take from that, that we want to keep and retain and build on. And, and what it gives us the opportunity to leave behind in our practice as well. The vision talks about that in, in, in several areas too. So uh, I think it's important because it gives us the responsibility to, to do something like that and to make sure that um, I guess society understands that contribution, um, but also from the individual's perspective as well, that everybody understands uh, uh, what volunteering can do for you uh, in terms of your own well-being and your connection to something bigger than yourself, uh, as you just illustrated as well. So I, I, I think there's a lot of that tone that comes through the vision, and I hope if people have had a chance to read it so far that they, they get some of that, but that's, that, that's why I feel it's important. Thanks, Gethin. And just to let those listening know, we will link to the Vision for Volunteering if you've not seen it, so you know where to find it um, in the podcast notes. But Chris and his team have got all of that expertise. Moving over to Jenny, then, what sort of what does the current landscape for sport look like, and, and why is this vision so important for that sector? Gethin's absolutely right when he talks about this kind of crystallising of a moment. I mean, we've obviously just spent the last two years in a, in a global pandemic. But even before then, there was change going on within sports volunteering, where actually we were seeing um, sort of falling in numbers, hardly kind of if we're looking at hard count of people who were giving their time, but also how people gave their time were changing. And at the same time, there's that sort of societal backdrop of a sense of role of technology, how volunteering fits within people's lives, a sense of what are the tasks and roles that they're, they're doing. Um, and as a sports sector, we're, we're relatively um, traditional and in the last possible way hierarchical. Clubs are often organised by a committee. There's a number of set roles. There's a number of sort of things that sit really, which has worked really well for hundreds of years. But things are changing up. So there was already a sense of change within that. And then particularly if you overlay things such as um, kind of diversity and inclusion and a way that we actually want to kind of invite more people in to the power and the magic of being involved with your local community sport or activity group. So if you kind of combine those sort of things, as Gethin said, it's quite a heady moment. So what does this mean for sport? Um, and actually, where does sport share a huge amount of similarities with the wider cross-sector of volunteering? Because actually, I think we'd want to move away from a place of thinking that sport's separate. The challenges and the opportunities are there for us all, particularly around equality and diversity. And in fact, that's one of the other strands that, get, that Gethin recognised recommended but also things like collaboration and how you work and doing things differently so that we move you know on an individual level volunteering doesn't exist in isolation I am a volunteer but I'm also a multifaceted deeply interesting person but it fits with all my other bits of life and likewise volunteering as a concept needs to fit within society as Gethin says we want to get to a place where everyone feels it's a natural and easy thing to do where skills development flowing into careers or flowing into, you know, health and well-being, there's a whole range of connections. And again, collaboration is another of those strands. So I think you're right, Imo, this is an exact moment in time where for the sports sector, it's a chance for us to look at ourselves, re-energise and collectively reach out and work with other sectors so that we can move towards that exciting future. <laughs> Definitely. And, and I think um, from when you go on to the kind of website and the way you've presented the vision for volunteering, 
games this one's coming your way so to prepare you but i think it's really clear that there's this kind of significant involvement of different stakeholders from charity sector and and kind of as well as sport that crosses the voluntary sector i guess two questions here can you talk to us a little bit about that process of the different stakeholders, how they've been involved, who was invited, and start to creep into that under the iceberg kind of process. And what have been the highs and lows of getting people together to, to kind of collaborate across all these different sectors? Yeah, that's quite a quite a big couple of questions there. So I'll, I'll have a go <laughs> at those. And just a, a very quick observation, if I can, as well, just on, on the, the previous topic. Uh, I agree with everything that both Jenny and Gethin have said. I think that the point for me is that um, as sectors, and I think we all do this, we, we tend to work in quite siloed kind of ways, and often that's that's set up for the convenience of people working within the sector. Um, that doesn't reflect the reality of the way people live their lives and the complexity of that. So yes, I'm a sport volunteer and participant, but also I love being outdoors and I'm interested in nature and music and lots of things. And those sectors and organizations are not particularly good at talking to each other sometimes and, and creating a kind of experience for people and families around all of that so i think this has been a hugely exciting um, exercise to work on um, in terms of the the highs and lows bit first lots of highs lots of really exciting challenging dynamic conversations uh, the opportunity to reconnect with some people that i've worked with previously in in different different jobs and at different points of my career making connections with completely new people as well who I've, I've never worked with and and kind of exposure to some some challenging and, and different perspectives on things uh, an opportunity for for us all i think on, on the sports side to step back a little bit from some of the day-to-day -day kind of process that we're engaged in and to look at what other colleagues in related sectors and organizations are doing so lots of highs um, genuinely uh, no lows at all some challenges in a process when you've got um, six or seven organizations and a lot of quite strong-minded creative people coming together with a fairly pressured timeline that creates challenges but I think Gethin and I were both close to that and, and I'd certainly say that was much more of a kind of energizing than a, a, a difficult kind of process but but it was a challenge on the, the process part I think the, the biggest strength of this is that there was a lot of genuine and open-minded consultation. So we've all worked on things where you're consulting in inverted commas, but what you're actually doing is kind of telling people what's going to happen and, and maybe kind of tinkering around the edges a bit. The, the consultation here uh, was a genuine one. Uh, we started with a completely blank sheet of paper, which was a bit scary when we were looking at that blank sheet of paper, but, but gave us an awful lot a freedom and, and latitude to 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 be uh, to be creative. Gethin, I don't know if it's worth you just talking a bit more about some of the mechanics of of how it worked because because you led on on that that side of things. Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. Um, absolutely. I, so mo most of the consultation and engagement took place towards the back end of last year, November, March time. And I think you're absolutely right. If I go think back to my community development days and the ladder of engagement, you know, consultation can be a bit sort of two way and transactional. We were much higher up the ladder than that. And that was quite terrifying. But 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 we we, we sort of took out ideas about what the vision could be to a whole whole bunch of different stakeholders so those early workshops there were sort of seven thematic themes and they were all the things that you'd expect you know there was a, a health and well-being one and employment and skills one um, each of them had a couple of co-chairs that were drawn from beyond the main leadership group which sport england uh, uh, sit on so so it, it was it was very devolved in that sense we um we mostly heard from people in the sector leaders and volunteering managers and and, and other uh, uh, other directors interested in, in that kind of area didn't hear um, probably as much as we would like from individual volunteers. That feels like something we probably need to do a bit more on next in whatever iteration of the vision kind of comes next. But but the conversation was really rich. Um, uh, 
over 350 people kind of got involved in those workshops. 300 organizations took part. There were like 19 people on the wider steering group. I think we received about 60 or 70 submissions, many of which came from local organizations. So, so people put their own concepts forward as to what the vision should be. And then James and I and others had this kind of like horrendous but really privileged job of trying to sort of sift through all of that and, and, and figure something out. And, and, and well, you can see the end products of that now, but all of the partners involved, especially on the leadership group, I think have been really keen to stress that it's, it's the start, not the end. And, and what we do with this now is a collective question for all of us. So uh, here we are, and maybe we have that question uh, for a long time. I, um, I, I thought that uh, reading through the vision and read it again this morning, just to remind myself of some of the finer detail, you've got this real challenge where volunteering, and Jenny touched on this a second ago, is intensely personal and inten you know, intensely unique and individual to the person doing it. But when you're trying to come up with a vision, you've got to try and come up with something that is generic and global. And that's a, that's a real challenge. And I think what you have managed to do is identify where the sectors can be better at not having a one size fits all approach and being more open to individual preferences and requirements and the change in society where you know we are becoming more individualistic and how how you can meet that need of the individual while still building community. It was, I think that, you know, uh, not to make you, you know, head, head swell too much, but it feels like you you've set the right kind of challenges within the vision to sort of go and challenge the organizations that take this on to to look at themselves through that through that sort of lens i don't know if, if that was on purpose or as a as a, a, a sort of an accidental uh, result of the sort of the work and what came back it's almost like you don't need to speak to too many individual volunteers to get the general sense of the direction of travel that the organizations are facing if that makes sense uh, i think you, uh, that, that that's just the feeling i got from what i was uh, as i was reading through it again this morning that's a question and more of a statement. I don't know if anyone's got anything they want to add to that, well, I'm not sure. It's really funny you say that, Chris, because I think what, one of the terms as a volunteer manager, and I don't know what you, you in the room feel, but I often see myself leading volunteers as a conductor of perspective. And I feel like a lot of my role as the champion and the lead and the paid person that's kind of trying to shape how to make volunteering easier, there is an element that those individual volunteers voices are something that I should be pushing up to you in those conversations and I, and I know Geth and James I was part of a smaller group with some other sports some great colleagues and and the emotion in the room when we were kind of feed, feeding into this it was almost this is really powerful that we're having the time to talk about this and think about it in a different way so I think the question sort of back to you is how have you written it in a way that creates a different kind of movement and addresses some of the things that Jenny talked about around nurturing that that better collaboration between sports organization and organizations and also how it's going to trigger positive change in this space over the next 10 years it was a great session that I, re I remember really clearly the one that you're talking about with 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 you and various other volunteering leads from from NGBs and I really enjoyed it. One of the things that really struck me is that a big part of the job, it, it seems to me, is doing what you say. It's collecting and amplifying the volunteer voice within the organisation and, and within kind of the sport community as well, which suggests that maybe we all need to have a slightly different conversation, given that we all say all the time, sport simply can't happen without volunteers. But uh, I wouldn't say they're always front and centre of the, the plans and, and conversations that, that we have. I guess in terms of the way it was written, uh, we had lots of conversations about that, spent a lot of time both on content, but also on tone as well. So the intended tone is supposed to be a mix of, I guess, kind of celebratory. So acknowledging and celebrating the amazing stuff that's going on out there. Also upwardly challenging as well. So encouraging those in strategic leadership positions to recognize and take on some of the challenges that that, um, that we're highlighting. But at the same time, it's intended to be optimistic and forward looking as well, because we found through the exercise a huge amount of enthusiasm for greater involvement, a, a greater distribution of power for people in communities to have more control and influence over their lives. Some of that, I think, does relate to age and is generational as well. That's not to be dismissive of older people who are very active and engaged, but particularly, I think there is an expectation amongst younger people that they will shape their own destiny. So 
that's the kind of balancing act that we've tried um, to strike with with the tone. The the kind of challenge as well is that we want there to be at least something in there that everyone reading uh, reading it will recognise. So we want something that will resonate with the huge breadth of organisations and, and and people that that we spoke to. I, I think we've I think we've done a good job of that. But the real challenge now will be to see what happens next. So how people are actually able to interpret that and apply it in their own organizational context to take on those challenges and to turn it into concrete action as well to make sure that the conversation that we're having in 18 months time five years time 10 years time is very different and we're reflecting back on on what's happened we've, we've tried to kind of weave that in a little bit to the way it's written as well so we've tried to project forward what would we what we would say in 10 years time would would be success so it will be a slightly scary but really interesting exercise to engage in in 10 years time to see how much closer to those kind of uh, i think quite ambitious uh, vision statements we've got to i uh, i did like the vision statement part of it it does it adds a bit of meat to the bones it adds a little bit of context it's not just airy fairy dreaming of we might do this it's almost like here's some targets to go and have a little look at here's something here's some sort of things to really aim towards uh, jenny how how's it impacted sort of the thinking and policy at sport england what's how what have you taken from this and how will it uh sort of affect the way you you interact with the governing bodies and the people you fund so it was an absolute privilege to be part of the vision for volunteering um relationship to the to this point and, and i think as you've heard from Gethin and james this is only the start you know your listeners will be able to go and read the document but really importantly on the tone and on the messaging around it is all about, about looking forward. It's about that honesty and transparency of where we're at and what the possibility is if we work together. And that aligns really closely to Sport England's new strategy, Uniting the Movement. And in that we say fundamentally there are some real challenges and real opportunities, particularly around tackling the inequalities in health and activity. But really importantly, we don't hold the answers and nor will we be able to be singly the, 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 there is no silver bullet, but actually together thinking systemically around how do people engage in sport and physical activity and importantly for this crossover, how people are, feel able to give their time to support themselves, their families and others into sport and physical activity. That is a really important one. So for me, I see it really nicely dovetailing into our work, into our conversations with our partners. And again, this is where the vision for volunteering is really powerful because it looks across sectors and it looks about empowering and handing that power to, to others. So working with national governing bodies, NGBs, we talk to them around how do they su support and govern their sport. They are a systemic partner. They have responsibilities beyond just the activities that they deliver. How are they thinking about their people? And how are they thinking about inclusion, diversity, trying new things? You know, how, how can we in our privileged position as a, as a funder be able to give them that reassurance and that confidence that they can experiment or pilot or how does good grow you know how does the stuff that you're doing really well in one part grow to others and how do we share because ultimately no single sport or activity will be the answer no format of volunteering will be the answer as james said you know it is intensely personal 10 million people gave up their time in 10 million different ways i should imagine yeah. last year yeah. and actually how do we make sure that it's the sum of the parts that is great in this as we look forward and move forward. And really importantly, how do we keep on bringing people into this conversation? Vision for volunteering was not a set of decisions, nor a set of recommendations, nor pointing to government, nor us to say this is what others should do. It's about how as volunteer managers or people who are passionate about this space, how can we feel excited and empowered to be like, I'm going to go and try that. And it's OK if it doesn't work or I'm going to learn from this or I'm going to work with somebody else to see what they're up to. And how do I bring more people into the conversation? Because my views are just from a particular limited perspective. How can I share this and bring this greater? Definitely. And Jenny, you started to talk about some of the five themes there. But I'm thinking if someone's tuned in and they're sort of, oh, great, you're talking about this vision volunteering. But what are these five big hitters? Gethin, will you talk us through some of the what those are and kind of what change you hope to see? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I will try and do my best. Thank you. So um, the, the only five, one of the best things about the vision is it's really short. I mean, you could read it in, the, in less time than it takes to listen to this podcast. It's mercifully short. And I think that's one of its strengths, actually. So there's a couple of themes that are really about, I guess, us in the volunteering sector and our, and our practice. Um, the, the, the fourth and the fifth ones for me kind of are in that camp, collaboration and experimentation. 
collaborate, you know, it'd be, you'd, you'd, be, you'd have to go far to try and find somebody in an organization who didn't have collaboration in their strategy these days, wouldn't you? It, it's a, we all recognize the kind of the, the power and the opportunity of that. Collaboration in a volunteering sense, I suppose, um, speaks to some of the lessons from the pandemic where organizations sort of, you know, left their silos at the door, um, uh, rewrote their processes overnight, uh, became a bit more trusting perhaps, um, and worked with others and sort of saw how that went. And there was lots of positives that we can take from that. So experimentation is in a similar vein, really. We did a lot on the hoof during COVID that we probably wouldn't have done in normal times. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit in the vision which talks about, I guess, you know, not not reserving these kinds of opportunities for times of crisis and trying to sort of build in that culture of collaboration and experimentation more often. So there's definitely some practice in there. The awareness and appreciation theme we've dealt with a bit already. That's about raising the the, the, the consciousness of volunteering in society for, 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 for what it can do um, and for the people that kind of take part in it. There's a really interesting uh, theme around power uh, which which um, talks about the power that volunteers have and tries to encourage us in the sector to uh, almost redesign volunteering around that a little bit. So it's going from top down um, to bottom up. It's going from more of a workforce model of volunteering where volunteers feel like a bit of an extension of our paid staff at times. You know, they do things that we decide are important um, to try to flip that on its head and recognise that volunteers bring an awful lot of power and legitimacy with them, as well as brilliant ideas a lot of the time, because they have this, you know, unique view of the world, being sort of in between different different types of customer, I guess, um, and and really make the most of that. And, and that's the sort of challenge in practice sense. Probably the most um, a kind of interesting one for general audiences, I think, is number three, which is equity and inclusion. And what I really love about this is that it tries to take volunteering into a very different type of conversation to one that it's used to. So I think equity and inclusion is something that we're all invested in. We're all trying to create a more equitable and inclusive society through our organisations. But this vision um, really looks at what contribution volunteering can make to that. And it's linked to the power one because it sort of starts to think about how power is distributed within organisations and what you what you give to volunteers or what, or what spaces you encourage volunteers to move into to see some of that power. And, and it says, look, if we're going to practice as a sector greater equity and inclusion, volunteering can be a really brilliant medium for that. So it's, it's fascinating because it's not necessarily talking about volunteering as an end in itself to do things for people or for society. It's, it's encouraging us to think of it as a practice and a way to actually bring greater equity and inclusion into our organisations through a sort of distribution of softer and harder power. So these these five themes for me, the easy thing would have been to write a vision which said we've just had volunteer responders, health and social care is the big opportunity for volunteering, let's spend the next 10 years doing that. We haven't done that. We've got these five themes and for me they feel like the big winds that are blowing through volunteering and they encourage us to say well how are we going to kind of harness these or adapt to these or or, or make the most of these um and that's how i would encourage people to think about it i guess the uh the, the power theme when i saw that when the vision came out i've got to say i was uh i was i was really chuffed that that had made it in there it's it's something i've been harping on about for 15 years that that as a, as a as a tech person uh the, the my belief in tech uh my my uh perfect well, world, democratization my, my, yeah in, in the perfect yeah. world uh, the, the technology should democratize power it should give volunteers agency it should allow them to make choices about their own volunteering and their own um their own direction of travel through their volunteering journey um and it's, it's something of the it was it's been something of the elephant in the room in volunteering for quite some time because organizations have a sense of ownership of their volunteers uh there, there's been a, over the years you know they're my volunteers is, is often been the prevailing feeling for certain organizations uh there is an investment organizations making those volunteers so you can understand where some of this comes from but there has been a a a lack of, a fundamental lack of understanding that it's a if you can make it about the volunteer and empower the volunteer that you can you can unlock this amazing resource of people being creative and doing things for themselves. I had a really interesting conversation at the gathering up in Scotland uh, uh, on Wednesday with a gent from the BAME community who set up an organization called Beards and Boots. And he was a, uh, I think he was a Bangladeshi gent and he decided to take his kids walking. And then he took his brother and then there's a couple of guys from the mosque. And before you know it, they've now got uh, five or 600 people going out every week doing outdoor adventure type activities 
you know, and it, it, it's a community doing it for itself, to itself, not being done to. And, and he, he found it quite hard to set up as an organization because he didn't understand the power structures. Either. You know, there's, there's those kind of systemic issues that are in place and coming from it from that side is really interesting in power and then coming from it the other side where that we, we're in this weird political situation where people are scared of the word privilege scared of the word power you know there's it's it, it's the most interesting and most controversial part of the vision i think i think it's the it's the bit where the biggest change can happen it's also the bit where you can end up on the front page of the daily mail if you're not careful so it's uh i'd, I'd just be interested to see what other people thought about that on this because it, it does feel like the so for it to be acknowledged so clearly is one of the clear, clear strands rather than it just being a sort of a background thing we have to acknowledge. It was really quite quite interesting, I thought. I, I'll, I'll just maybe read a bit of the power one for you to give you a flavour, because I, th I think you're right, Chris. I think it, it, it can feel like a, uh, a threat to volunteering because it's a threat to sort of the way we do things a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think m many of us probably have quite a tr tribal take on volunteering, probably based on our earliest experiences. You know, this is volunteering and that isn't volunteering. We often have conversations with people who might say things like, well, you know, um, uh, employee volunteering isn't real volunteering because it's through a private sector company or something like that. And we're trying to get away from some of that. The actual text of the power one, I don't think is, is that controversial. I'm going to read you a bit here. A future where the power of volunteers and communities is recognised and supported, where volunteering is understood as the community taking action, often enabled or supported by organisations, but always not always driven or generated by them. So it's this idea that you know we are their enablers rather than they are rather than they are our volunteers. And for some people, I guess you know this feels like oh that you you know just doing something for the sake of it. But for me, it's not just the right thing to do. It's a really strong business case for this as well yeah. because because I could you get you, you get far more out of your volunteer contribution if you would really empower them to do things in a way that really inspire them. And if you try that, you'll you'll see exactly what I mean. And many volunteering organisations. Are already doing so so i hope it's not too much of a threat but i understand where that comes from and it and it's massively interesting sorry chris i feel okay. like this is where we could develop a whole nother podcast on each of the five strands of vision for volunteering but it's interesting that a, a behavior or value that a lot of organizations try to champion is around empowerment yet there is this fear around giving trust around that power model and 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 i guess what do you think organizations can do or jenny is there anything from sport that you've seen done really well where that has actually been nurtured and that power element has enabled brilliant things to happen that possibly have given people the confidence that sometimes letting go is okay and it will be okay i don't know whether you've got any examples from some of the research that you've collected through the pandemic and the innovation there Yes, in fact, you're absolutely right, Imo, that um, often a little bit like James spoke earlier about the fear of the blank page is actually if you were starting on this, you think, oh, my goodness, this feels really daunting. But actually, there's loads of really good practice and it starts with trust and it starts with authenticity and it starts with your values as your, your organisation. And actually, we have seen some great things through the pandemic of uh, organisations, clubs, grassroots groups kind of changing things up and uh, doing things slightly differently. But we've also, across the last three years now been partnering with I Will around youth social action and this mm -hmm. is the perfect example um, you know as a sports sector we've actually been really good about involving and trusting young people you know the number of young coaches and the like but actually this takes it a step further and this works with partners who are often not uh, you know not those who you traditionally work with us and actually saying start with the young person and the point of youth social action is it's it's responding to a community or felt need so it's almost starting with them and saying, what is the challenge or what is the opportunity that you see? And then support them through it. And um, my colleague, Kristen Natali, has just published uh, the evaluation of this. And I'm sure I can give Chris the link to put to alongside this, great. which actually shows some really simple things that you can do to involve. And it's not just for young people. It just happens. This example was young people and volunteers in what is the challenge? What is the opportunity? And therefore, the solutions that come out of it are amazing and the work that you collaboratively do to get there. And actually, this can be anything from, you know, in the case of our, um, our Potentials Fund, which we did with I Will, anything from um, older children mentoring young, younger children through particular key moments, like the primary school to secondary school move. It could be um, uh, girls getting together to explore kind of what it means to be safe in public spaces and what physical activity can do that around bullying, body image, 
uh, you know, peer pressure. It can be anything from, you know, creating opportunities to align with other agendas such as the environment or helping people move into space, you know, outdoor spaces they're not used to. So there's loads in there and they're all really exciting examples. But actually at its heart, it's something really simple to say, just start with your pe people, be people centric and think about who would like to be part of this? Open that, open those doors up and bring it in. And I know, Emma, you've done a huge amount of work with Netball to actually bring this to life. Uh, thanks, Jenny. And I feel like that might be another podcast in itself as well, Chris. But, you know, <laughs> I think so. Roster, eh? <laughs> I, uh, I think um, when, we see, when we've seen this successful, it's almost like there's a need, there needs to be a culture of saying yes rather than saying no. Uh, when, when someone comes up with an idea, uh, it, it'd be a local authority or a a facility owner or whatever the whatever it happens to be there needs to be that culture of being able to say yes to it rather than looking for 10 excuses to say say no to stuff uh james you uh you what what do you think yeah i i agree and part of it just reminds me of the covid example so i know we don't want to dwell on that excessively but uh, and i also know i'm i'm biased because i'm a trustee but just thinking about some of the work that we do in bristol the scale and the pace and the urgency that we worked at during mm -hmm. covid and also the really kind of seamless partnership working which hadn't always been easy that happened was incredible and and some of that's been able to continue so that principle that actually if there's something that needs to be done let's get on with it rather than let's construct hundreds of reasons why it's too mm -hmm. difficult it is absolutely a lesson that i think we can we can learn um, on on the PowerPoint as well, uh, this is this is probably the theme that we found most difficult to write. And for me, I think it's the most important because everything flows from it. So all of the ambitions in there around being a more equitable, inclusive and diverse sector, all of the ambitions around more natural collaboration, being more responsive, all of that has to flow from a, a more sustainable and, and a fairer distribution of, of power as well without uh, kind of betraying too many confidences, I think that's the one area as well where I detected a little bit of pushback from, frankly, those who hold power at the moment. And what does that actually mean? And what will that look like? I think you probably have to go a long way to find someone who doesn't agree in principle that power isn't very fairly shared. When that comes down to, this is no longer a theoretical conversation and I might actually have to lose some of mine to give it to someone else, that's where it becomes a bit more challenging. Um, but for, for me, if that becomes a real thing and not just an ambitious kind of statement, then that will be yeah. a huge success in, in this exercise. From, from my perspective, and I'm only one of a team of writers, uh, it is a bit challenging and it's meant to be. And if it's a little bit uh, scary for some people, then I don't think that's a bad thing because it, it really is an issue that, that needs to be addressed. And in, in the community consultation we did, that came through very, very strongly, that people don't necessarily feel that they have the power and influence that they should have to control what goes on in their lives. And they want it and they will use it wisely. So let's make sure they can have it. Well, and James, I think that you, you raise a really good point because I think there's an, a, a tendency that with the word power, we can get stuck on the top of the tree and that kind of devolving power from the top. But actually, yeah, exactly. yeah. There's, there's a huge element of how do we give individual volunteers the power to remember they have a choice in volunteering. And actually, uh, sort of, again, without um, disclosing individual conversation with volunteers, but in my kind of role, talking to netball volunteers, there's a number of netball volunteers doing three to five roles because they feel they have to, because if they don't do it, then there's no one there to do it. But actually, we need to support them to understand where do you really want to focus your energy and efforts and how almost, Chris, where you say, can we encourage more people to say yes? But at the same time, can we encourage more volunteers to say no, because I love this bit and I want to do this bit really, really well. So I think where we talked about these thousands of perspectives, the really exciting part, it's almost through these conversations, we're really seeing the way in which you've written the vision volunteering and the kind of power theme could mean so many different things to different people and, and how we create conversations that unlock that movement to where we want to see volunteering in 2032. It's that classic uh, example of you want something done or you always ask a busy person. That's uh, 
you know, it's uh, the unconscious bias. So they, they like they know what they're doing. Let's go and ask them to do a bit more because I know I'll get it done if we ask them. And it's, uh, it, you know, real life gets messy very quickly, doesn't it? That's, the, you know, that's the, and I guess that's kind of where I'd like to finish really. How do we, there was some target set in the vision. How do we turn the vision into actual, what, what's, what's, the, what's the next, that, not the sort of the next uh, big picture steps. What are the specific things that can happen over the next 12 to 18 months that start to turn some of these things into reality so it doesn't end up another nice strategy on a bookshelf somewhere because uh, i know it's not a strategy but what why do we turn it into strategy then tactics and actually stuff we can go and do i'll jump in on that one you're absolutely right chris the the point of the vision for volunteering is it's not a strategy there's not a task list that needs to be ticked off but instead it's about how do we build a connected movement of uh, individuals and organizations and communities who are absolutely like, yeah, this, this, I see this, I want this. So I guess the first ask to your listeners is if you haven't yet, um, have a little read through the website, um, have a little think. And really importantly, just let, let us know or start that conversation with someone else. You know, that hopefully there'll be things that you agree with, but also I hope there'll be things you disagree with. What, what are your ideas? On the website, we're asking for um, uh, individuals and organizations to, um, I'm going to say pledge, but yeah, I guess it's a pledge. It's a commitment. What does what does this make you feel you want to do? What are those first steps? And this can be big or it can be really small. Um, and this is where we want the conversation to grow. So these next six months are about growing this conversation. And then it's also about in your day to day work. What is it that in light of having read the vision, what are you thinking of? So if you're a volunteer manager and you're just about to do your annual survey, what, what's the lessons from this that can help flow into that or myself? I'm um, working with colleagues as we kind of look at delivering our our strategy. Where does the role of a person centred volunteer approach really fit in? Where does where does tackling inequalities? What does that mean for our volunteering space? So actually, I think for me, it is that about growing that conversation, growing those connections. And also, you know, I'd definitely be really keen to hear from anyone in the sport and activity sector who wants to chat about this or who has had some thoughts. You know, it's not the consultation is done. Thanks very much. It's how do we keep this conversation going and what are your ideas and what are you doing? and What are you learning and what's not worked well and what's been great? As I said earlier, how do we help good grow? I, uh, I love that. It's not uh, as, as maybe in the past some of Sport England's projects have been, should we say, KPI driven. Uh, this is sort of much, uh, much more up my street of how, how do you make good happen? You know, it's not we need this many people doing this many things at this many hours at this many time. It's tell us, tell us your story. Let's build a still the movement, still the narrative, it sort of sits much more comfortably with me as a man that's filled in an awful lot of uh, paperwork <laughs> in the past for Sport England funding. So uh, yeah, this is brilliant. I love it. Fantastic. Gethin, James, what would you love to see kind of listeners do or even what's your personal and professional commitment to the vision? I'll jump in. Uh, you know, that's uh, absolutely everything that Jenny said. Um, uh, uh, but I also think that uh, the answer is kind of up to us. Uh, or oh, you're right, Chris. I think it will die if nobody does anything with it. I, I think we've given we've given a lot to think about, and and there are there are there are five themes there um, that people can start to weave into their own strategies and programs. And and if you're in a local organisation or a national organisation or any volunteer involved in organisation in any sector really, one thing you might want to do to sort of figure this out for yourself is have a go at a bit of an exercise that we did in putting the vision together and you can see this on the website it's called the three horizons which is some sort of management tool i haven't come across it before but it's quite useful and it asks you to, to, to consider three different sort of change scenarios i suppose and the first one is uh is, is themed around sort of business as usual and in moments of pressure or change in any area volunteering for our case you see certain things kind of dying or on the decline they, they come under pressure uh, and we gave some examples of what these things might be the concept of a volunteer army or sort of paint a fence type CSR volunteering. Um, then you have a second curve which deals with disruption uh, and that might be something like COVID or, or, or perhaps even you know the role of a, a new technology that kind of breaks through and then you have this third curve which is sort of emerging futures and this, this is sort of where the vision is going by 2032. What, what would we want to be on that curve? So have a look at that graphic because it's a really nice little exercise to do in your organisations. What would we put on each of those curves for ourselves in our own volunteering programs. The ones that we've done in the vision are just illustrations. They are not 
the results of consultation particularly. They are just things that people talk about in volunteering that we use to sort of make a point. But figuring out kind of, you know, what you think needs to go from your programme, what's interrupted your programme and where you really want it to go in the future uh, is a really healthy exercise that, that, that we can all do. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one again, about KPIs because everyone that's worked with me has heard me moan about KPIs almost incessantly <laughs> for the last 20 years and how we're all obsessed with them and we spend all our time kind of making up and then hitting targets yeah. rather than doing what we're supposed to. But it was interesting that actually operating with none at all, I found uh, just a little bit nerve wracking sometimes. That, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how, how are, you know, we don't need to overload this, but how are we going to know? And I think the answer does lie in um, organisations and individuals taking personal responsibility to set their own kind of targets and ambitions around it. Um, I think the question around what we're going to do personally is a great one as well. And I, I thought about this a bit. And the, the thing that I'm going to try and do is, is again, around this theme of, of power. And uh, as someone who you know, has, has some, some relative power in some organisations, um, I'm going to do what I can to make sure that we are um, spreading and sharing that appropriately. Uh, and also in my uh, in my paid work as well, work with lots of organisations who uh, engage with communities or communities of practice in different ways, but I'm not sure they're great at handing over rather than harvesting power. So that's the one kind of challenge that I've set for myself and hope to be able to come back in future and, and talk about that and what I've actually done in um, in practical terms. But this point around striking a balance between being purposeful and, and having accountability without overloading it with targets is something that we were really conscious of. And ultimately, I think we've ended up in the right place. But that was a, a difficult conversation because we, we just didn't quite know where, where to land on that. But as, as I say, I, I think we've got to, uh, to a good place and a, a kind of appropriate balance. Fantastic. I my, my again, being a technologist, uh, I think there's a role for technology in some of the platforms that are out there that would you know, we may be able to take some baseline and look at the potential growth across volunteering in a uh, in a more hands-on manner than you know the, the sampling that's putting on do through their for their uh, active people surveys and stuff like that is is phenomenal and it's a massive sample. But maybe there's a role for technology to get even deeper into that. You know, we can actually see what people are doing volunteer-wise and and uh, and get a little bit more uh, into the data. There is a lot of data floating around out there and maybe there's some way of uh, bringing some of these data sets together more effectively as we did do in COVID with the value of volunteering work we were doing with uh, Jurgen Institute of Volunteering Research. There is something there maybe, there's, there's some big data sets knocking around that we might be able to, to, to use to say, sort of take an indicative look at the, the sector as a whole and look at, the, you know, at, at, over the next couple of years, do we see some trends and changes that uh, may be coming out the back of this work you know you would only see in big data sets but you may not see when you're asking individuals about the specifics because it doesn't really show uh, at an individual level but you can see it at a population level but that's just for me so that may, me meandering and thinking about what we what we might be able to do with a conversation with me and jenny for another day maybe yeah. <laughs> well, and i think i think um you know we've talked around the room about each other's personal and professional and and i have to say thank you to you chris for inviting me to Kind of be part of this podcast because you all know that the awareness and appreciation element of the vision is probably where my kind of passion lies and i think having podcasts like this that start to create conversations that people can listen into that kind of really promote that creative thinking it, it is is just those kind of small steps that will lead to that positive change so certainly my personal commitment is is being involved in things like this to try and start those conversations and I think some of the stuff we've talked about has been really, really powerful. And it's nice to hear, whilst it's brilliant and a beautiful website structured really simply, I think you've really brought to, to life the journey that's taken it to get there. And I think sometimes we forget that. We just see something and think, oh, well, that's nice. But actually, the stories that you've listened to to kind of create that, individual volunteers right through to those volunteer managers have been represented and it's how that, that they can start to feel they want to continue to get involved to make sure even more are represented i guess we're sort of about there we're just about running out of time um is there anything anybody is there anything we haven't covered that you would like to talk about before we go we've got a very quick challenge and i think um two on you so what two words would you use to sum up volunteering personally or professionally for you? 
um, and we can go round the room and then say a big thank you to you for coming on and to those listening for tuning in for 40 minutes. Gethin, what two words would you use to summarise personal or professional volunteering for you? Wow, oh, I love these questions, really. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm I'm cheat slightly because there's a hyphen in between. I'll say life changing. Can I get away with that? Okay. Really yeah, think so. there's, no, yeah. there's, no, there, there's nothing else like it that you can do. It really isn't. James? Um, my first one's fun because actually something that came through this exercise again, and again, I've talked about this quite a lot. Um, it, it is kind of meant to be fun. That doesn't mean it, it it's all frivolous and easy and that we're not dealing with difficult issues, but actually it can be fun sometimes. And there is a danger of sucking all the fun out of it. So so fun is, is the first. The second is um, it's challenging. And I mean challenging in the sense of challenging kind of preconceptions and views. Um, people that I engage with through the volunteering work I do are very different to the majority of people that I work with professionally. And it takes me out of uh, quite a comfortable, potentially quite insular and probably pretty middle class kind of professional bubble to actually engaging with a different group of people and a group of people who, frankly, are delivering inspiring, amazing stuff that I really couldn't do uh, all of the time. And often doing that balanced with some pretty challenging personal circumstances and caring responsibilities and other things too. So fun and challenging are my two. Uh, there are lots of others, um, but yeah, let's go with those two. Yeah, don't use any more because you put Jenny under more pressure. <laughs> yeah, I'll steal any remaining words. Exactly. Um, I am in awe because I'm not a particular wordsmith, so I'm, I'm scrubbing around here. I, I first of all, connected. Uh, similar to James's point about challenging it, it absolutely helps me be connected with others. And my second one, I'm going to say identity. Uh, I once toyed with the idea of when you do your little blurb or even your dating profile when I was a bit younger, would you put in there that you're a volunteer? But I see this as a, a part of my identity. You know, I'm a member of a trade union, a political party, my local library. You know, it doesn't make me sound fun, but it, it is fun and it's an important part of my identity and value. So I'm going to leave it, leave it there and your listeners can go away and uh, <laughs> make of it what they will. Amazing. Uh, well, I've really enjoyed talking about this and I feel like we could have gone for hours more, but a huge thank you, Jenny Gethard and James for coming on and being part of this sort of first series. And Chris, hand over to you to kind of like do the roundup. Well, again, I can only say thank you to you all for spending a little bit of time with us. It's, we're, I think we're on episode number six of the podcast and it's, it's been a real pleasure with everybody that's come on to have these kind of conversations. It's, it's nice sometimes to spend an hour talking about this stuff in a, sort of a, a, an open forum like this and it helps sometimes remind me of some of my feelings and thoughts about the sector and why I do it you get bogged down sometimes in the day-to-day -day of it it's quite nice to have these sort of conversations so I really appreciate you all spending the time with us today and Imo I'm looking forward to uh, doing a few more of these and uh, chatting to a few more people we've got a couple more episodes planned um, that's it for this week's episode guys we hope you enjoyed the podcast if you did, please leave a comment below. You can always get in touch at pod at teamkinetic.co.uk. That's pod at teamkinetic.co.uk. If you've got any guest suggestions or things you'd like us to talk about or anything like that, we'd love to hear from you. And if you haven't liked and subscribed, then please like and subscribe. And uh, thanks again to all the guests. And I look forward to speaking to you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.